We are recording and we're live on YouTube. I'm sorry for the delay. All set? We're all set. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the Environmental Impact Commission meeting on Wednesday, March 24th, web-based web -based meeting hosted on Zoom. All votes will be by roll call. First vote is attendance. Mary Cronin. Here. Jeff Harold. Here. Mark Massoud. Here. Matt Rose. Here. Ray Gallo. Okay, thank you. Next is the acceptance of the minutes from March 10th. Uh, everyone can vote on them except Mary. Oh, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> What's your pleasure, guys? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Motion made and second to accept the minutes. Remarks, additions, omissions. Try your minds. Jeff Harold. Aye. Mark Massoud. Aye. Matt Rose. Aye. Steve Gallows, aye. Thank you, motion carries. Old business, regulated activity 1129, Encompass Health, Reserve Road and Corporate Center Drive. Um, let me see, Mark, uh, Ward, did you wanna start? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Ward Mizuko, uh, here again this evening with uh, uh, Eric Lindquist and Matt Pop. <clears throat> when we left off last time, there were some uh, comments from uh, Mr. McManus um, or impending comments from Mr. McManus. Those comments have come in. Our team has responded both in written form as well as uh, through the submission of some revised plans, which I uh, emailed in today. Um, if they're not readily available to the commission, I'd be happy to share my screen or perhaps Eric could share his screen. But uh, I believe that we've addressed that latest round of uh, changes. Would you like, uh, would it be okay if Eric were to take it from here to explain our, re our response to the changes or to the comments? I've activated yes. the share screen. I'm sorry? I've activated the share screen. Okay. Um, all right, well then I'll, do you wanna do the plans first or the probably the narrative? The uh, yeah. Either way, so for the record, my name is Eric Linquist. I'm a professional engineer in the state of Connecticut, and I'm a senior project manager with Time Bond. Um, after the last meeting, we did submit uh, the erosion control plans and the various plan sheets that Mr. McManus did not have, so we had those to give review comments to and provided them to us. Additionally, there was questions um, related to the monitoring activities that are going on site. Uh, we had submitted a letter to Mr. Janey identifying what under the general permit for the state of Connecticut that is anticipated for the site since due to the amount of disturbance being proposed, um, what those measures entail. And that was submitted, uh, I believe, about a week or so ago, a week and a half ago. Uh, so that should be uh, with your documents as well. But I'll start off today by going through the comments that we got from Mr. McManus. Uh, the first question was during the initial phase depicted on plan C600 and discussed in the narrative including C601. We would, uh, and this is him speaking obviously, we would recommend the two temporary diversion swales, one to the south sediment trap 01 and the other to the north sediment trap 02 be incorporated into the plan and keep keyed into these traps. This will ensure that the bulk of the graded area above the regulated wetlands would drain to the sediment traps and not rely on perimeter controls alone. To accommodate this additional area, project engineers should adjust the wet and dry storage of the sediment traps as necessary. Uh, the response we provided to that was the two requested swales have been added to the erosion control drawing. Uh, the size of each sediment trap has not adjusted since those associated areas were already accounted for in the design of the sediment traps when they were originally designed. Um, so I can show the plans now. Are you gonna, sh are you gonna show them? Probably easier for me so I can zoom around. If you want to share your screen, I can share. Okay. Uh, I can I can pull up the plan if you like. Uh, All right. Is everyone able to see my? Oh, there we go. Is everyone able to see my? Or did I get the wrong screen? Or I think I might have nope. get the wrong screen. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. My fault. Do you see that my my which screen do you see right now? Do you see this plan, or did I put the wrong screen up? Well, we see the plan. All right. So. Um, 
the, the main things that were changed, uh, as we discussed, are up here. Uh, we did add a swale, as is denoted by these dashed lines right here, going to the sediment traps. And we put in here two, two foot deep drainage swale keyed into sediment trap as requested. We added one again on this side over here to protect the downward slope. Uh, the, like I said before, the size of these sediment traps, we already had watersheds that delineated this area over to these traps anyways. Uh, it was our intention to have these graded off, but it didn't show. So we're more than happy to add that to the plan and show it so it's more obvious to the contractor. Um, but this is the general intent is to have these swales come over here and be keyed in. Uh, that detail was added to the plans and that is shown over here. So this will be a stone line drainage swale using a modified riprap, which is about a six inch stone. So it'll have a course, uh, so it'll take some erosion capability because it's gonna be a larger stone. It won't, the, the stone won't wash out. Um, and it's roughly a two foot wide swale with a one on two side slope on either side of it that'll go and get keyed into the um, sediment traps on either side. In addition to that, we were um, requested, uh, actually that's, that's it for this, uh, for this comment. So I'll go to the next comment. Um, the next one was number two, we would recommend that in the final phase depicted on C601, which is shown here, uh, which is not, not shown here, I'm sorry. Um, in the discussed narrative included in plan C601 that the proposed retaining wall be built prior to work associated with the building since the wall will act as the effective erosion sediment control barrier protecting the regulated resources. Uh, the response that we provided to that was, as noted in our prior commission meetings, the perimeter retaining wall will be erected as early in the construction process as possible since the building and a significant portion of the site work cannot be started until the required fill is placed to establish the finished grade. What I'm basically saying is most of the build, most of this area that we're going to be building out where the wall needs to be has to be elevated several feet, in some cases upwards of 20 feet. <laughs> so the, the building can't start until that wall is in place because we need to be up there. It's, it just can't happen until that fill is in place. So. Um, that the whole intent of our erosion control, as we noted, was to put that wall in as soon as possible so that we can start elevating the site and building the site out as soon as possible. Uh, the third comment was instead of the called out called for silt fence and hay bale perimeter control associated with the site's steep slopes, we would recommend a combination of reinforced silt fence, also known as super fence, and a 12 inch diameter silt sock or waddle. The reinforced silt fence is more rigid and better able to withstand water soil pressure against it. The silt sock slash waddle should be filled with compost or finely ground leaf or bark mulch rather than straw or hay. It should be trenched in four inches immediately above the silt fence barrier. This ES and C measure is much better suited in taking out fine soil particles than the type of silt fence hay bale combination. So we've updated the plans and that was the response. And you can see up here, we've called it out as a heavy duty geotextile silt fence and a bark mulch log barrier. Um, that extends the whole perimeter of the wetland resource. Uh, going around all the way to the discharge and basically our um, details associated with that were also added. So here's the bark mulch log waddle which shows the four inch embedment depth and it's the four and the eight inches is a total of 12 inch and it will be bark mulch as requested. So that'll be the waddle. And in addition to that, we have also added the super fence detail which you can see is also a reinforced silt fence. So it's more heavy duty as was requested. So both of those improvements have been added to the plan as requested. Uh, the last comment is due to the sensitivity of the wetland resource, the steepness of the slope above them and the sheer amount of proposed earthwork. Um, and this is once again, Mr. McMahon speaking, we would recommend that a third party erosion and sediment control monitor EI be employed to monitor the site during the entire construction phase until final stabilization is achieved. The monitor should visit the site on a weekly basis and also within 24 hours following a storm event of one inch or more. Brief monitoring reports should be prepared and submitted to the town staff uh, within 24 hours of the site inspections. Uh, the response I gave, it is our opinion that this level of oversight will be redundant and not necessary given the rigorous requirements of the Connecticut Deep General Permit process and the level of reporting and monitoring already being anticipated as part of the permit. The requirement of the general permit and the routine inspection procedures were provided uh, to the commission in our March 19th, 21 2021 letter to Richard Janey, which is what I just discussed at the beginning of my remarks. Uh, the weekly inspection reports will be maintained in the construction trailer. However, we can ensure the weekly inspection reports are distributed to the commission and or health department as well if desired. Um, I would also point out that the requirements of the Connecticut Deep Permit are actually more stringent than what is requested here. I believe it's after every 10th of an inch plus every week, regardless of rain. So we'll have, there'll be someone out there that's a, a licensed road control inspector or a PE or someone that has the knowledge to do this type of inspection. 
and they will be out there on a weekly basis, rain or shine, um, as well as every single time there's a tenth of an inch, I believe is the amount. Um, I'd have to look it up. I'm pretty sure it's a tenth of an inch. After every one of those rainfalls within 24 hours, there also needs to be inspection. And there'll be detailed monitoring reports going through any repairs needed. Um, the contract will be required to have extra waddles on site, extra silt fence, extra hay bales. All the erosion control measures will need to be out there so emergency repairs can be made at that time of inspection. Um, so we feel this is a, a very high level of monitoring that's actually more than being requested and it's already in place. So we don't think another inspector on top of all that is required. And with that, that would be the response to all those comments. And I think I'll be done with that word and I'll release this. So that uh, concludes our response to the latest round of comments. I hope that we've established to the commission's satisfaction that we will uh, not have an impact uh, on the wetlands, are not likely to have an impact on the wetlands, and um, we're happy to answer any additional questions that uh, you may have. Jim, did you want to respond to this? Uh, sure. I'm, uh, I'm satisfied with the response from not only this meeting, but the last meeting. And uh, yeah, that fourth comment, we didn't have and we weren't privy to any of the DEP comments yet. Um, I'm not even sure if the applicants even applied to them as of yet, since we're still in the process here. So I'm satisfied uh, with what they've planning to do during uh, not only the, uh, the with the wall, but the entire construction site. Okay. Anybody on the commission have any questions? Mark? Um, I don't have any questions, Mr. Chairman, but um, I would also add that um, I'm reasonably uh, satisfied with the with the uh, both with our consultants to reviews and with the applicants um, response. Um, so uh, I didn't get a chance to look at or review any of the information that came in today. Um, and the uh, I would take under consideration, or I would suggest we take under consideration the comment with regards to the the the, uh, the inspector. But um, it seems I, I don't want to say anything out of place. But um, have have our have our staff direct uh, or have our staff uh, uh, put together a a resolution. Anyone else have any questions or remarks? If not, I, I will entertain a motion to table so that um, Rich can get some time to put a report together for the next for the next meeting. I would make Anyone? a motion that we table um, application uh, table the application until the uh, next meeting pending a resolution. Second. There a second. Motion made and second to table regular activity. 11.29 to our next meeting to give staff time to come up with a, a, a letter of approval. Any re no remarks on table? I'll try your minds. Mary Cronin. Yes. Jeff Harold. Yes. Mark Massoud. Aye. Are you are you muted? I can't hear you. Uh, I'm sorry. Aye. <laughs> Matt Rose. Aye. And I'm an I. Gary Shanansley. We'll see you at the next meeting, guys. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Thank you very I much. You I bet you guys can't wait, huh? <laughs> Pardon me. To come to another meeting. <laughs> bet you. Thank you all okay. very much. Thank you. Good night, guys. Okay. Next item on the agenda, regulated activity 1130, City of Danbury, 14 Hayes Town Road. Um, Mary, were you going to read this into the record? or? I'll be happy to. I'll be happy to. Would you, would you please? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Today we received a letter of a formal withdrawal from the engineering division. It is addressed to Richard Janey, it says, Dear Mr. Janey, based on your confirmation of what I communicated to the commission regarding the EIC not having any jurisdiction 
over the proposed project, the City of Danbury Public Works Department is withdrawing our application from the Environmental Impact Commission. As discussed, Mr. Wood of First Light clarified that First Light's review jurisdiction supersedes EIC in this area of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission project. Please do not hesitate to contact me with any questions you may have at this office, 203-797-4641. It is signed sincerely, Antonio Idarola, Director of Public Works and City Engineer. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. Any questions on this? No. Rich, Richard, do you want to tell them what, what went on? Yes, good evening, everybody. Please, um, please tell us, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> so, I spoke with um, Brian Wood, who is the land and property manager for First Light. Um, and we had a lengthy conversation and he was able to um, kind of explain the boundary of the FERC uh, grant uh, permit that First Light has with, with the federal government. And if I could actually share my screen, I can Go ahead. show Did it work. I can show the map of exactly where the project was. <clears throat> so if we look down here, this is Danbury Town Park and this magenta or red section um, indicates the property owned by First Light and it is beneath this red dashed line here, which is the FERC boundary. Uh, the proposed work for the fireboat dock and the gravel parking lot falls completely within that FERC boundary. Um, and therefore, Brian, Mr. Wood explained that that is First Light's property and, and it is up to First Light to provide uh, a resolution and a approval or denial. Um, also, Mr. Wood also indicated that any any potential future permits or, or applications within the FERC boundary uh, shall be immediately sent to First Light um, as EIC does not have jurisdiction over First Light's property. Uh, anybody has any questions? I hope I can answer them. I will return my screen to everybody else. There we go. Thank so, you, Richard. Yeah. I think that's pretty cut and dry. Anybody have any questions or anything you want to say? Bernie, the only thing I would have is how are our residents going to know that they don't call us for that anymore? We'll have to deal with it as it happens. I don't know. How else would you deal with it? Well, we could send out, they could send out a letter saying that any work below that. But at the same time, once we do that, I just think it's like opening up a you know, while we thought it was below the 440 line, you know, that type of stuff where we still would have jurisdiction. I think this is a quagmire for us, or at least a potential quagmire. I think, I think we should just take one issue at a time. Mm -hmm. No, I think you have to. I think you're right. You do. Yeah. I'm just, Mr. I'm Chairman, just I, I, I agree. Um, FERC has been, has been exercising their, their federal jurisdiction for, for a long time now. And uh, Brian has been in his job for a very long time, so he's pretty attuned to uh, to the uh, the boundaries and 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 the and the jurisdiction. And I think that uh, any inquiries um, really that just come in uh, are handled by staff and 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 sent in the in the proper direction. Anyone else? Motion to accept the withdrawal, just to make it official, please. I make the motion. That was Jeff. Second. second. Motion made and seconded to accept the letter from the Director of Public Works and withdraw the, the request. Roll call vote. Mary. I approve, yep. Jeff Harrell. Yes. Mark Massoud. Aye. Matt Rose. 
Aye. And I'm an aye. Carries unanimously. Okay, thank you. Next item on the agenda, regular activity 1132, Worcester School, 91 Mybury Brook Road, athletic, synthetic athletic field. Someone is here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to um, thank the commission for the opportunity to present this plan to the, um, to the uh, Environmental Impact Commission. Uh, I'm Mike Jumper. I'm the chief financial officer in the Worcester School. And um, presenting for us tonight is Rob Champlin, who is the project manager, and Mabel Gutliff, who is um, going to present the stormwater pollution prevention plan. Um, we would like to install a synthetic turf field on our um, premises at 91 Marybrook Road. Um, the fields uh, that we have are, um, um, are all grass fields at this point. Uh, many of the schools that we compete against um, do have synthetic turf fields. Um, this synthetic turf field would allow us to get on the field much earlier in the spring and stay on the field obviously much later in the fall as well. Um, we're currently um, having to go out and uh, rent field space, uh, especially in the early spring in order to get out on the um, rectangular tur uh, turf fields. And um, we're very excited about this. Our, um, our community of parents has been very um, generous as it relates to this. Uh, potential project, and it's something we've been considering for quite a long time. So without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce Rob Champlin, who I believe is going to start speaking, and then he will um, introduce Mabel Gutlip, who, um, who will address any stormwater issues that um, we've considered. That's correct. Good evening, everybody, and thank you. Um, as uh, Mike said, my name is Rob Champlin. I'm with Clark Companies. We're um, designers and builders of outdoor athletic facilities in the Northeast. Um, been at it for about 35 years. We have professional staff as well as our own construction crews to um, see this project from concept design uh, right through to punch list and finish. So we'll be one point of responsibility uh, throughout the entire project. Um, and with that, I'd like to Kind of thumb through the pages. I don't know how much you've seen, but I'd like to thumb through the drawings quickly and then um, turn it over to my colleague, Mabel Gutliff, uh, to get into the details of the stormwater management, erosion control, and stuff like that. Um, can I share my screen, Mary? Yes, uh, it's open for sharing. Okay, now I just have to find it because I'm new at this. There we are. So this is the existing site. Um, I just wanted to throw up a Google Earth map. This is Mary Brook Road here. This is the Worcester the School. We're not seeing anything. Oh, it not didn't yet. come up? No, not yet. No. Oh, sorry. Uh, How about now that? Now something's going There it is. There you That's go. My apologies. My apologies. <laughs> There's two steps to this. So um, <laughs> this is the existing site here. It's an existing baseball field. Um, dugouts, backstop. Uh, that will be removed as part of this. Um, it'll be accessed, you know, via the parking spaces that are existing. Um, and like Mike said, it'll, it'll allow for a lot more usage, uh, outdoor recreation, because um, the existing field is saturated. I was out, you know, doing some preliminary survey um, earlier this year and, and got to witness it firsthand. So it'll be a, uh, you know, a drastic improvement um, to, the, uh, to the overall site. And now let's see, I wanna do a different screen. Well, how do we do it? I should have started with a drawing screen apparently. Okay, sorry about that, folks. All right, now the drawing sets. Um, can everybody see that? 
Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, existing conditions plan, what you just saw. Um, we did do a limited topographic survey, you know, to uh, pick up all the site contours. It is uh, fairly hilly to the west, um, leading down onto the field itself. Uh, next. Next, demolition and removal. Like I stated, we are um, taking down the existing dugouts and backstop, batting cage, um, taking out the infield mix, um, home plate and pitcher's mound, and anything related to a baseball field. Um, and there is an existing electric line that we are going to relocate and capture, um, perhaps for a scoreboard installation. Um, the construction of a synthetic turf field is a, you know, a carpet, an infilled carpet over top of a porous stone base. So to construct that, you need to strip off any organics, uh, topsoil um, that's on the field uh, to allow for the base to be stable over time. Um, so the topsoil from this existing field is proposed to be stripped and placed to the west to create another benched area a few feet higher, perhaps for spectators, perhaps for other recreational area. Um, and there is an existing drain line it, and it also will capture run on um, from the hillside. Uh, so with that, we'll, we'll put the porous stone base, concrete curb around everything um, it is getting a four foot high chain link fence around the entire field with netting at the ends to catch, um, you know, shots on goal, stuff like that. Um, balls that, that go errant. Um, grading and drainage. I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to let Mabel address that. That's what you guys are most interested in. Same with erosion and sediment control. We did have uh, some comments in the pre-application meeting. Um, from Richard or Mr. Janey, and I believe we've addressed them. We've, we've removed kind of the parking area, the overflow parking area that was down here, and we relocated the construction entrance um, per those comments. Uh, erosion sediment control detail, and you folks aren't interested in electric. So with that, um, without further ado, I'll turn over um, the presentation to Mabel. Uh, my associate, and she'll go through the um, grading and drainage. Good evening, all. How are you doing today? Very well, thank Thanks. you. How are you? We're doing good. Um, so as you can see, if I slowly drag my mouse along, this is the 100-foot buffer line where it passes through the athletic turf field footprint. Um, we, as our pre-application meeting kind of discussed, to try to reduce the amount of potential impervious surface within this buffer. And from the narrative, you can see where I outlined what was in there from the dugouts, baseball, infield mix, all that kind of stuff that we are taking out and sort of then creating a net reduction in the impervious surface within that buffer. Um, the wetland was delineated and all of this footprint up here is upgrade from the athletic field down to this bridge crossing. And then all this footprint here is downstream of our athletic field footprint. Um, so we have erosion and sediment control, silt fence in this footprint where most of the grading activity is taking place to prevent any silty runoff accessing the wetland area. Um, additionally, we relocated the construction access to the site so that there wouldn't be any trucks or anything traveling down this um, lightly used road. And I will switch gears and jump into how the stormwater management of the athletic field works. Um, the field itself being a carpet on top of porous stone is vertically draining. So any water that lands on the field vertically drains and is then captured within the field storage system itself. Um, the way it worked out on this site with the existing soils being a hydraulic soil group D, they generate a lot of runoff themselves if there's actually enough grade for the runoff to go somewhere. On this existing condition site, 
you can see out here, it's very flat. We'd have to have better existing soils for the water to absorb into those soils and truly disappear and run away. Um, in reality, they don't do that right now. So that's why it's wet and very difficult for the school to play on in the springtime because the water doesn't have a way anywhere to go because it's very, very clay type soils that are there right now. So when we switch to a porous stone system that allows for um, a drainage time frame that is, <coughs> excuse me, that matches the existing drainage so that we can um, match the rates of discharge from existing to proposed. We have in this system set up for an outlet control structure. Yikes, it's running away on me. An outlet control structure, as the field is pitched from that upper corner, pitches from this corner down to this one and same thing from here to here. So all of the water runs this way into these two collector lines. It is routed to this outlet structure and then to this outlet pipe. What I have done is as a reminder, this is the wetland buffer, the 100 foot buffer. We have outletted this system as close to the Marybrook footprint as we can get um, to try to minimize any potential erosion happening between our outlet and Marybrook, which that lands us in the wetland with the riprap and the flare down section of the outlet pipe. That is the only change of surface that's within the wetland itself. And that is strictly to minimize erosion in the wetland to the maximum extent practical. Um, and the alternative I just discussed in the narrative that we could slide this flared end section and rip wrap back, but that would require regrading on this whole bank to make that fit and more disturbance in the um, stream bank itself being that this install would just require removal of the woody brush and the briar material, um, stripping away the topsoil that's there, placing geotextile fabric and placing stone. All of that's done in less than a day's time frame. So this footprint requires very minimal disturbance to slide this back and regrade this and then place fabric and riprap and seed and mulch on what's been regraded. While it can be done in a one day time frame, it's additional disturbance happening on the stream bank that could be avoided. Granted your approval. Um, am I forgetting anything? I don't think I don't, so. I feel like I'm forgetting something. You wanna elaborate on the cross section? Just I can this, jump to the cross section. The storage in the I'll jump there. In the stone. For additional clarity on how the synthetic turf field works, this field cross section, the stormwater, if you follow my little mouse, um, would fall onto the turf surface, would perk through this sand and rubber infill mix, would perk through the porous pad. All of that is there for athletic safety. <clears throat> Um, and into this dynamic stone bayer, dynamic stone base layer. Um, this stone base layer has a 40% void space so that as the water is flowing through that, um, it flows through it at a fairly slow rate, um, matching what it flows through at a, on the existing conditions footprint. Um, both of these cross sections are showing that there's the geos textile fabric on the subgrade that's so that any potential loose soils from subgrade don't migrate up into the stone. And then all that stuff is gonna, because the way the field is pitched, it runs into this collector trench and into the collector line, which then is directed to the outlet structure. Um. I think that was it on my stuff. Yeah. How do I go back to them? Stop share. Stop right share. Yep. Okay, go. back at you guys. Um, at this point, I would open it up to see if you guys had any questions, comments, concerns. Um, 
open it up to whatever you want to discuss, whether it's for me or for Rob. Anyone on the commission? I have no questions, Bernie. Okay, anybody else? Chairman? No Chairman. questions. Richard, you already went through this, right? Rich? So I did a quick uh, pre-meeting, um, pre-EIC meeting, just kind of to touch base and give just a couple of heads ups and, and pointers. Uh, but I, I do think uh, Commissioner Massoud had something there. Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, I would just like to ask a, a couple of questions. What kind of um, pollutant load from is typically expected from from an artificial or synthetic turf uh, type of uh, area, and how is that um, typically um, mitigated since the drainage uh, is directly to Myrie Brook? I'm going to share that back with Rob because that's his department. <laughs> so the the turf system itself is porous, as Mabel alluded to. It's a um, sand and EPDM rubber infill, which is a virgin rubber. It's not recycled tires. Um, so the, the stormwater that falls on the field drains directly through um, the sand and rubber layer. It's filtered by a filter fabric there at the base that encapsulates the, uh, the plastic grass blades, then goes through a porous rubber pad with very small openings again. Um, and then after that travels through a clean stone layer um, to the outlet piping. So there's, you know, a lot of filtration on that. So as far as pollutant load, there is none. It's whatever's in the rainwater. Sounds good. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else have anything to say? So on the outlet, is there anything, like, um, anything to catch any sediment or anything on the outlet that's going into the, the brook? We have a, a flared end section and riprap proposed to catch anything. But the only the only pollutants we would expect would be, you know, during the short construction process, and that, you know, in this case, we're planning um, if everything everything goes according to plan. We're planning on opening it up in June, um, and being complete by mid August. So it's you know summer construction, very quick, um, and that's the only potential and that's why we've uh, you know designed the erosion control practices we've designed for it and anyone else have anything mr chairman yes uh if i may um <clears throat> with with all due respect uh, just doing a quick search on my uh, uh on my phone um uh, leads to some some talk about microplastics and, and heavy metals uh, in all that are contained in uh, in some uh, artificial uh, turf grass uh, uh, installations um, notwithstanding and, and not knowing the specific company um, that you're dealing with do they can they provide us or can you provide us with some you know specific specific information with regards to the construction and to um, uh, somewhat um, verify the, the claims uh, that um, uh, that are being made? I can. Um, Connecticut uh, Department of Health has actually done studies on synthetic turf, and I don't remember the year, but I can provide those. They are um, publicly available. The um, heavy metals, I think, were a concern a few years ago um, with regard to recycled truck tires. Uh, we don't have that in the system. The system we are providing is an A-Turf uh, Titan 50. And I mentioned the EPDM rubber is not a recycled product. It's a new rubber product. So um, that was done to alleviate some of those concerns. But I can certainly share with the commission um, the studies that were that have been previously done by the state of Connecticut. Right. That would be appreciated. No problem. Anyone else? Motion to the table, is it order? Make a motion to table regulated activity uh, 1132 to the next scheduled meeting. Second. Second. Motion made and second to the table regulated activity 1132 until our next meeting. 
give Richard a chance to go through this. All those oh, I have to do a roll call. <laughs> Mary, Mary Cronin. <laughs> yes. Jeff Harold. Yes. Mark Massoud. Aye. Matt Rose. Aye. I'm a yes. Motion carries. Thank you. We'll Thank see you, you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman before much. before they sign off, um, could I have the correct spelling of Mabel's last name, please? Sure, it's uh, G U T L I P H. And Mabel, M A B E L. That's correct. Thank you so much. You got it. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Here's how we have nothing else before us. Motion to adjourn is in order. So moved. Second. Motion we'll remain second to adjourn at. 740, roll call vote, Mary Cronin. Yes, sir. Jeff Harold. Yes. Mark Massoud. Aye. Matt Rose. Aye. And I'm an aye. <laughs> Thank you very much, motion carries. We're all done. Thank you, good night. Good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Mary, are we off? One moment. Mm -hmm.